Buzz Lightyear of Star Command is Buzz Lightyear. Tim Allen was just the toy. That's all. That's all. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Milo. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. Uh, I don't believe I've ever been to Richmond, Virginia, so. But everybody's loved here. My son went to school here. He went to Washington University. No, he went to American. I should know. It's my son. But it's great to be here. I failed out of junior college, so for me to be anywhere, And they made me their com commencement speaker last year. They made me alumni of the year. And when uh, the nice lady from the college called, I said, you know, I didn't finish. And she said, we know that. <laughs> and then I said, your alumni pool must not be that deep. And she said, nothing. And I said, I'll do it. So I actually did that last year. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but I love what I do. And uh, it's awesome to be here. I was supposed to be a Catholic priest because uh, my mother let me know at the tender age of 11 that she'd given me to the Lord and that I was going to be a Catholic priest. You don't do that to kids. That's how serial killers are made, I think, personally. <laughs> but I did have a challenging upbringing. My mother, uh, actually, when I was 13 years old, walked around our neighborhood passing out pamphlets on the sins of masturbation. So that did not get me <laughs> in with the cool kids. And, sir, imagine the guilt I felt when I... You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm pretty good at reading people. Don't be embarrassed. We all do it. Not as much as you, but we all, all do it. <laughs> Get this man a drink. But, um, yes, my upbringing was a little bit challenging. But what, what our escapes were, were cartoons and movies and, you know, because we didn't have cell phones and games and stuff to... That's all we had. And, of course, the greatest magic was always Disney. Always Disney for me. So, I love the right? I mean, Disney deserves that. It's Disney. And so my first opportunity to work with Disney was, would have been Buzz Lightyear, I think, years ago. It was a TV series, and so Tim wasn't doing that, and so I did it. And then Tim, he did not like me at first. He, only because the first three episodes we did, he had to dub or loop over because Disney wanted to release with the original Buzz Lightyear voice. Even though we did 60 episodes, they took the first three, and then Tim was stuck in a studio for nine hours having to match my cadence and my timing, which is very different from his. And so he was just cussing my name for like nine hours. <laughs> and then we ended up working uh, on a movie called Big Trouble Together, and then we did another movie called Joe Somebody where I smacked the crap out of him in front of his kid. <laughs> And it was on the set of that, uh, as he was laying in the, con in the concrete there after I just give him a good fake swat, and I said, I must be your worst nightmare. I voice your character. I'm following you from set to set. I'm here beating the crap out of you. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be like this, Tim. But we get, we get along fine. He actually went back to LA, produced a show, and then, and then hired me to do it. So Tim and I get along great. But it was, uh, that was, that was, I was doing that before I got my opportunity to do uh, the Emperor's New Groove, and so <laughs> that I was very excited about because as a Disney file and to get to be in a Disney movie, and so I was very excited. What was interesting about that is that Disney's very secretive with their scripts, so they only give you like four pages, and you don't know what your character is. Is he an ogre or a giant, a robot? It's animated. All I could see was that he was a reticent henchman, and he liked to cook. And so I decided, you know, instead of making him dark like this, you know, which could have worked too, we're going to miss my dessert that I spent time working on. See, that <laughs> could have been interesting as Kronk. But I just decided to make him kind of sweet like that, so. <laughs> we're going to miss dessert, and I worked so hard on that. I don't know if that's the line. So that, there was that. And then, uh, then uh, by the way, we didn't, that wasn't the first time I worked with Miss Eartha Kitt. Now, this is weird. We worked together 10 years before The Emperor's New Groove on a movie in South Africa. And when I came back 
from Zelda, and I was 22 years old. When I came back, Eartha Kitt was performing at the Roosevelt Hotel in Los Angeles. And I thought, well, I just did a movie with Miss Kitt. I'm gonna go see her show. So I went to go see her show, and she was thrilled that I was there, and she said, darling, why don't you come up to my room, we'll have some tea. I said, okay. <laughs> so I went up to her room, and she's everything you could imagine, just very much the grand dame. And she excused her butler, and she sat on one side of the couch, and I was on the other, and she was petting this furry creature. I, to this day, I couldn't tell you if it was a dog or a cat, because it had hair. <laughs> And she goes, she goes, darling, how are you? And I, I knew very, very soon, very early, early on, that I was way out of my league. <laughs> and I'm not saying she was <laughs> hitting on me or anything. It was just very uncomfortable. <laughs> so after about 10 or 15 minutes, I excused myself. I just didn't really know what to say. And then we do The Emperor's New Groove together 10 years later. And if you look at the relationship between Yzma and Kronk, it's very, very, very close to what it was like in real life, 10 years earlier. <laughs> I just thought, it is weird how the world works. <laughs> so then after that, it was Family Guy. I got involved with that. And my parents hate, hated, hated family, family Guy. They still just, my mother is part of uh, the Parents Television uh, Council trying to get TV shows off the air. <laughs> and one of those shows is Family Guy. And my mother asked me actually to sign a petition one day. And I said, Mom, I'm gonna remind you what I do. At this point, I was actually helping support my mom and dad. I go, help support you guys with Family Guy money. This is her way of Catholic laundering the money, I guess. I'm gonna put my kids through college with that money, but you want me to sign this. I go, if you don't get the irony, mother, do not think for a minute, I will not talk about this publicly. and throw you right under the bus because this is insane. Um, yeah, my, my father was in the monastery for three months. He almost became a monk. He was in Gethsemane in Tennessee, and his spiritual advisor was Thomas Merton, a very cath uh, famous Catholic scholar. So my parents are very, very religious. And so they've always hated Family Guy, and they begged me to get off it. Um, my mother is 86 years old and still teaches chastity in um, you know, elementary schools and high schools, and I'm sure that goes over well. Um, not that I don't believe in it, I'm just saying that when an 86-year-old woman comes in to your classroom and says, you be good, I'm not sure that flies. Um, <laughs> I didn't get any and you're not getting any either. I think that's sort of the <laughs> message. But that was my, that was my, uh, that was my upbringing. All right, uh, we're gonna open this up to Q&A and everything, but uh, Milo's awesome. I'm gonna bring Milo, because we're gonna go back and forth a little bit, but I just wanna make an introduction. And again, thank you all for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here. I, I'm happy to have you here, because 24 hours ago, right? Yeah. You were on the other side of the country, yeah. making a surprise appearance <laughs> at Disneyland at Soren. Yeah. How did, how did that come about? How did, uh, did, did they call you and say, hey, we want you to be a part of, uh, of this, of this? Well, yeah, well, they did. So we, we shot that last Saturday at Disneyland, yeah. And so they had an idea for social media and stuff that, you know, in the soaring ride, and I don't know if any of y'all been on it, but I'm your chief flight attendant. And then, uh, so what they did was they showed the video, and then the door opened, and then I came out in the flight attendant uniform, uh, just looking more like Tom Selleck. And I flight. But uh, yes, I guess they knew it was me. And so then I, yes, then I brought them all in. And it was really fun. So it's on social media now. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, I, I love Soren. Yeah. Um, and you said you're a Disney file. Do you have a favorite Disney ride? Hmm. I've always, uh, always loved the Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. I have a thing I do, which my kids hate. But I have to do it every single time. And uh, Disney will hate me one day if everybody starts doing it, but maybe we all can start doing it. Listen, if you feel it next time, try this. So when you're in the boat okay. and you're cruising past that very quiet restaurant before you go in. All right, the Blue Bayou. The Blue Bayou. It's all very quiet. In a loud pirate voice, I say, I recommend the veal! <laughs> Which is funny, because it's a pirate and they don't serve veal and whatever, but. <laughs> 
And my kids were always like, oh my God. I did get shushed one time by a waiter at this restaurant. Now, I wanted to have a dialogue like, really, sir? They ruined somebody's fantastic dining experience. But um, yeah, so that's one of the stupid things I do. Or sometimes in line at Sorian, I like to do this too. Because, you know, you'd be there, hat, glasses, whatever, nobody recognizes you. And then when I pop up on, on the camera, I'll just tell everybody in line, I go, be quiet, be quiet, I love this guy. <laughs> First they're like, who's this jerk? Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, okay. Where is the weirdest place that you have been recognized? Hmm. Hmm. Hopefully not in a confessional. <laughs> I don't know what I think. Uh, I don't know. I really, the weirdest place I've ever been. I was mistaken twice today for Rob Riggle. I, well, I was thanked for my service. And I go, I know who you're talking about. But we do go back and forth a little bit, yes. That's, that's, that's yes. I guess. Mean, yeah. uh, sort of. Sort of, right? I get yeah. it. I yeah. get it. Uh, He's younger. Uh, and then something I want to talk about again before we open it up. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. you had your golf tournament. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so how long have you been doing your, your golf tournament? Uh, 14 years. 14 years. Yes. Yeah, so it benefits St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, greatest hospital in the world. So Jim McMahon, who was a quarterback for Chicago Bears Super Bowl MVP, uh, Jim McMahon, his old buddy of mine, and he had a tournament about 14 years ago. It benefited St. Jude's. And I was there, met a kid, little guy, patient from the hospital, and his family, and then somebody from the hospital asked if, you know, I'd come out and read to the kids. So I said, absolutely, I'd love to. But I go, I'll do you one better. I'll host an event. And the guy from the hospital flew out to our house that week, hung out for like three days, and we started it. And by year three, we were the number one event in the nation for St. Jude, tournament event. So we've That's been for the last 10 years. That's tremendous. Yeah. Well... Yeah, we do it out in the Coachella Valley out in Palm Springs area and got a great you know, chairman who runs the event and a lot of people work really, really hard on it. And St. Jude Children's Research Hospital inspires so many. So, you know, and also you got to be careful with charities these days. This is not a foundation or anything. So when you come to our event, you write a check to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. That's where it goes. Um, but this hospital, you know, when you think about it, they're non-proprietary. They share everything they have with the rest of the world. They're the pioneers of therapies and cures for catastrophic pediatric disease. Um, they take care of every family. Nobody pays a bill. The way they do everything is, is really quite miraculous, you know. And, and all the other children's hospitals and that, they all get their stuff, you know, from St. Jude. When they opened their doors, you know, back in, I guess, the early 60s, the cure rate for leukemia was 4%, and today it's 94%. That's, you know, so it's primarily due to the work that St. Jude does, you know, when everything was going on with Ukraine, they, St. Jude put together a hospital train and took all the kids out of Ukraine that had cancer and moved them to Poland on a hospital train to take care of them. So they do a lot of stuff. And now they're sending chemo to Africa. They're, they're you know, footprints worldwide, so. That's, that is tremendous. Yeah. All right, uh, what's your handicap? Uh, right now, I guess I'm probably playing around to about 10 or 11. Okay. Yeah. Are you a, are you a better golfer or a better poker player? Um, well, listen, okay. <laughs> golf takes skill and poker. Now, I'm sorry if you play, but I mean, I'm an amateur poker player, and I actually did a poker event one time with poker pros, the whole deal. I never played a hand of poker in my life in a casino, ever, and I won the whole event. <laughs> now, I will never win a golf tournament against pros or pool, you know, shooting pool or anything else. It takes real skill, but you know, poker just a little BS in here, and you, next thing you know, you're standing on the podium and you got to check. But I, <laughs> you know, I know it takes a little something, but yeah. Uh, so we do have a mic right over here. So if uh, you do have questions, feel free uh, to start lining up. As people are start uh, start to line up, uh, I have a, a question. To my, uh, and it's my favorite question to ask, and that is obviously you've uh, been on one of the biggest TV shows uh, of all time. Uh, some of the, the, the biggest movies. Um, and now, you know, you're, you're, you're doing conventions. But has there been another celebrity, another actor that you met for the first time and you kind of got a little fanboyish? Yeah. Uh, maybe you, uh, you couldn't speak or maybe, maybe you spoke a little bit too much. 
I've actually met him a number of times, and he's very gracious, and, uh, but I have trouble talking every time I meet him, and that's the great Eddie Vedder, so. Yes, yes. It's all about the music. Yeah, Eddie Vedder. Do we have any Eddie Vedder fans in the house? Come on. Yeah. All right, so we have some questions. Hi, I'm James. Hello, um, James. Nice to meet you, sir. Um, so, really big fan of your work, uh, especially your voiceover work, but one thing I've just noticed throughout your career is that you play a lot of, for lack of a better term, himbos. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have to ask, who would win in a fight, Brock Sampson or The Tick? Mm. Well, hmm, I know, but The Tick can lift up dump trucks and stuff like that. But Brock wrestles alligators. I'd, I'd have to go with the tick. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to go with the tick. Yeah. Thank you for the question, James. Hello, hello. How about that one? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Javier. A uh, big fan of your work on a series of unfortunate events. I thought that was a great Netflix series, working with Lucy Punch and NPH, of course. Uh, which Guardians Care would you want to be under in that series? Well, first of all, um, I thought that uh, I discouraged you from watching something as sad. <laughs> it's the live of the bowlers. Um, whose care would I want to be under? Okay, none of them are great, were they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought Lucy Punch was great. I'd be under. Lucy's great. At least she's. Squalor's great. Yes, she's entertaining. I would go with Lucy. Yeah. Lucy Punch. That's fair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you. Hello. What's your name? Marion. Hello, Marion. We have a lot in common in terms of wheelchair and things like that, so uh, <laughs> that's why I came. But um, I actually wanted to ask you about um, one of your, I don't know if I'd say lesser known or maybe lesser talked about works, and that's Hoodwinked as, uh, as the wolf. Yeah. And uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm a big fan um, of your work as Wolf, and I wanted to ask you if you have any thoughts on your time and kind of what is regarded as a bit of an obscure movie in terms of animation and just when it came out or any fond memories working on that film? Well, let, let's talk about Hoodwink because, see, that was one of those interesting things. I was working on another project, and so the editor said, um, I've got some buddies they are doing an independent animated feature in their apartment, basically, the Edwards Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and so it wasn't exactly doing cartwheels at that point. And no independent animated feature had ever gotten a major theatrical release ever in the history of the world. So I go, what's it about? And they go, well, it's like Little Red Riding Hood, but the wolf is um, an investigative reporter who thinks he's Fletch. <laughs> You've got my attention. <laughs> so I read it, and I go, this is really, really clever. So, um, uh, so I did it. But, you know, we did it for like nothing, you know. I mean, we were getting paid scale and it was a lot of work and, you know, for an animated feature, that, that was nothing. And I, so I said, I talked to my agents, I go, look, just let's say hypothetically, this becomes the first animated, independently produced animated feature to get a major theatrical release, we have to have a contract. And they're like, oh, yes. I go, shouldn't you be thinking about that, agent? <laughs> so I had a contract. Now, the Weinstein Company saw this film at the Berlin Film Festival, and they picked it up. So immediately, you know, it's a Weinstein production. That's how all of a sudden they're in the animation business. And um, Weinstein uh, did not recognize any of the contracts and just said, sue me, which nobody would touch Weinstein back then. Nobody really cares about him now, which is great. <laughs> So it was interesting. I loved it. I loved doing it. It was really fun. But yeah, none of us got paid anything because he just said, he just gave us the fingers, they say. So, yes. So, Do you anyways. have a favorite Hoodwinked character? Uh, um, hmm. <laughs> I like, who, who's the rabbit? Was that Andy Dick? Boingo. Boingo, yeah. 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 Yeah, oh, I like this, my squirrel friend. He was awesome, yeah. <laughs> Thank Especially you. when he was on coffee, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure.
Hello, hello. Hi, I'm John. Nice to meet you. Hello, John. Pleasure to meet you. Um, I was wanting to ask you about one of your works, um, your your character in the movie Rebound with Martin Lawrence. Um, I know your character. He talks very quietly, and then all of a sudden he goes to the uh, to the loud voice and such. Now, was that part of your character, or was that a um, trait that you gave in your per performance? Um, I believe we played around with that one a little bit, you know, and I, I knew he was just, you know, he just had to be the worst, most annoying coach type figure, and that's what we, <laughs> that's what we just tried to put together there, or create. Yeah, he was a little gross, um, but uh, yeah, that was fun. That was a fun one working on. Yeah, was, thank you. Thank you very much. Patrick, now that I'm down here, I can actually see like the back of the room. It's standing room only back there. I know you can't. I know it's very hard to see with those lights, uh, but it's standing room. There's there's no seats in the back of the building. <laughs> wow, wow. Thanks. I feel the love. <sighs> what did I say? All right, we're going to keep your seat warm for you. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I'm sorry. sorry. Hi, my name is Cameron. Hello, Cameron. Hi, and I just want to say I loved your performance in Family Guy and Ted, too. And um, there's a question I always want to ask. Um, in Family Guy, what's your favorite and funniest moment of being Joe Swanson? Ooh, hmm. Okay, there was one real awkward episode where Meg had a crush on Joe. I just thought that was so... <laughs> so gross and funny, but... Yeah. yeah, and that was fun, too, doing it, because I actually got to... Normally, we, rec we record by ourselves, but um, I actually got to record in studio with Mila, so that's never a bad thing. Never a bad thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Mason. Hello, Nathan. Mason. Nason? Yeah. Nason. Uh, Mason. 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 <laughs> give me five minutes with this. So. <laughs> Mason. Uh, one thing, I am a huge fan of uh, smaller production proje projects like Ted 2 is yeah. one of my favorites from you and along with Kronk. One thing I wanted to ask is how did, how did it feel being in the tick suit bowling the patrons at Comic-Con at the end of Ted 2? <laughs> Uh, I just thought that it was wonderfully awful and stupid and silly and fun. And then I realized, too, that, you know, I never asked Ben's permission. We just showed up and did it. And afterwards, I'm like, Ben? It's Ben Edlin created the tick, as, we, as if you're Tick fans, you would know. And I'm like, I go, Ben, we just did this really funny thing uh, in the Ted, no, Ted movie, and I'm dressed like uh, the Tick. <laughs> I'm the biggest jerk in the world. It's like, okay. <laughs> You'll like it. You'll like it. Is that all the, my favorite one was the final one. The, um, hey, watch that floor comes up fast. Oh, what was that? Watch that floor comes up fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I hate bullies. I, I was the smallest kid in school. I, I weighed 95 pounds freshman year in high school. Coke bottle glasses. I always went in three contests. My eyesight's worse than yours. My mother's crazier than yours. <laughs> and I had a worse neighbor than you. And I've won in all these contests always. I'm wearing contact lenses right now. Normally I wear glasses over my contact lenses because, because uh, they only make contact lenses up to a certain power, which I can see and, you know, I can cope with. But if I want to see 2020, I actually have to wear glasses over them. So when I was in school, I weighed 95 pounds, giant Coke bottle glasses. But I have played so many bullies, smacking Tim Allen around. Ted, rebound, whatever. Hate bullies. It was so great to talk to you. Great to talk to you too, Mason. Make sure everything comes together. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's coming together. <laughs> yeah. You got that right. Hey, what's up? Um, so, so my name is LJ, and I'm a big Kronk fan, so I want to know, what was your favorite moment about becoming Kronk from the first movie? Mm, I grew up on Disney movies. I remember, you know, like the sword and the stone back in the day, and 
Sebastian Cabot's narration and all that. There's just something always been magical about Disney movies to me. So anytime I was over at Disney, just, you know, voicing and doing it was just a thrill, you know. And one of the fun things about doing voiceover work is that there's no real right or wrong because you're just a, you're having fun with a character and experimenting with it. They don't know what characters sound like till they hear it because they can have four pages of a, of, a, of a character and they still don't know what it sounds like till they hear it. So that's, I think, your job as a voiceover artist to show them what a character sounds like. And then once they like it, then you can't do any, anything wrong. You're just having fun playing with it. And then it's like, well, we could use this, this, or this, you know. One of the things that I find more difficult is actually just doing narration. And a great example of that was um, Roy Disney, uh, before he passed away, when he was 90, his great passion was sailing, the Transpac race. So he would sail to Hawaii and back. He did that a number of times in these races. And so he was making a documentary about his passion. And he re requested me to narrate it. So I was sitting or not saying, he's sitting next to me, right next to me. He's not in a booth, he's right next to me as I'm narrating his passion. And he's, he said 90, and he's listening to every word. And uh, it got very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> there's no way you can't hide. In characters, we hide, you know, we have fun. Narration, you just feel sort of naked. So to break up, to break up the tension, I just thought to myself, I gotta do something here. I'm gonna tell Roy about the time I went to Disney jail. <laughs> so, yeah, when I was about 19 or 20, I guess, I went to visit Disney with a buddy of mine, and one of my buddies was working on the monorail, and my other buddy and I, we got on the people mover. This is the ride they had. We thought it'd be fun to get off while it was moving. <laughs> Which we did, and that place shut down. It was like Logan's Run. We got... <laughs> Like what? I mean, it stops, lights go on, red light it is it was, you know, and there was nowhere to go and we got busted. And uh went to Disney jail. And uh then uh, we're not allowed back in the park for a little while. Um he loved the story and then it got comfortable and we were able to finish his documentary. But yeah, I forget what it's called. It's about sailing. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. I wander around a bit here and there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alexander James, and um, because um, the Venture Brothers was, uh, to me, was an affectionate parody towards Johnny Quest, what are some of your favorite um, Hanna-Barbera shows? Mine's are SWAT Cats and The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest and Dexter's Lab. Oh, uh, Hanna-Barbera. I remember the one with the cars racing. I remember that one. Yeah, um, I used to love them. I waited in line one time for an hour to get the book that Hannah, Bar Hannah and Barbara had done on animation, and they were both there signing it. And I got it signed for my girlfriend, my wife, my wife now. This is years ago, and she's an artist. And I was so excited to give it to her, and she could just give a crap. But <laughs> she's like, that's not my style of animation. I'm like, what? She also doesn't like the peanuts, peanuts too, which is un un-American. <laughs> Part of that has to do with the fact that I broke up with her when we were 19, when I was 19 years old, I broke up with her on Snoopy riding a skateboard stationary. <laughs> yeah, all right, and it's so, you're a really cool girl and everything, I think you need your freedom, I wrote all this stupid <laughs> other stuff, yeah. I did, I go, I didn't bring that girl to church to make you jealous, I did, I brought another girl to church. I go, she's a nice Jewish girl, just trying to turn her on to her faith. I mean, it was the stupidest, <laughs> By the way, I just found out I'm 13, 12.4% Ashkenazi. Just found that out two, three years ago through 23andMe. So my first text was to Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> On the day. I go, Jerry, I'm 12.4%. He goes, welcome to Yidland. So I got Jerry's blessing. Um, again, I don't even know what I'm talking about now. And that has nothing to do probably with your question. I'm lost. Did I answer it? There's your answer. <laughs> also, hey, Peter. Hey, Peter. <laughs> hey, Peter. That's very good. Hey, um, Hello, Moses. Did your mom... <laughs> we'll talk about your mom for a second. Did your mom... Uh... Okay. 
If we could put the phones down just for a second. There's no <laughs> I love my mother dearly. She knows she's crazy. All right, let's talk about mom. So did your mom have anything to say when you told Elaine to go get the newspaper because she was going to go to hell anyway? <laughs> they didn't... Seinfeld show, guys, Seinfeld. They didn't seem to have a problem, actually, with the, that one. You know, it's other things. Their problems are more like, say, in the realms of something like Family Guy, which is satire. So they see a lot of that stuff as blasphemous. And, and that's sort of the nature of satire. They're equal to opportunity offenders, and that's just the way it's got to be. So satire is not for everybody, but that's where they really have issues and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, they didn't, they weren't crazy at all about that. Well, okay, the first episode I ever did of Seinfeld, I got two pieces of what I would consider, what you call like uh, hate mail or negative. One was from a politician in Orange County who said, um, uh, I don't know, we've never met, but I know your parents, and I can't imagine how disappointed they must be at you right now. <laughs> because the, the episode was, I, I'm Jerry's mechanic and I steal his move, and I'm using it on Elaine. <laughs> well, he must have been right, because the other piece of mail I got was a six-page letter from my father. <laughs> In that episode of Seinfeld, there's no sanctity to the whatever. I know there's kids here. I don't want to talk about sex stuff. Uh, that was their problem. That was his problem. The great thing was is that all their friends and neighbors all loved the show, and be, they couldn't help but they just got a barrage from their neighbors. Did you see Seinfeld last night? See, and then all of a sudden they had to sort of join the bandwagon there. But uh, never on Family Guy, no. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Alex. Hey. Uh, if you had told me, like, years ago I'd be talking to David Putty, I would have joke i would have been like no way um anyways i'm here to ask you actually about mr bertram your new show that is oh, yeah. coming out on the daily wire i'm yeah. just curious uh who turned you on to the show and how did you get involved in that project well adam sandler so it was a, just a, yeah and so i love adam he's a an old buddy and so it's an animated thing you know um it's an animated project and so we're doing it and then the daily wire picked it up you know so in the realm of politics and stuff like that, I stay, I stay out of it everywhere. I, first off, actors who open their mouths about politics, I think, are idiots. <laughs> For the most part. Nobody cares. Your job is an entertainer. Talk to your friends, your family about your politics. But. So um, I'm not, I don't have political affiliation. I know Daily Wire might be, but, you know, but uh, it, 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 maybe I do, but I don't discuss them. Um, uh, so that's where that, that show ended up, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left. We're going to try to get through as many as possible. Hello. Hey. Hey, Patrick. I'm Tom. Hey, Tom. How are you? All right. How are you? Very Thanks well. Thanks for coming to Richmond. Thanks for uh, having me. Of course. Please come back next year. All right. Uh, I got my first tattoo the same week you got yours, your VFD tattoo. Yeah. It sucked. Uh, <laughs> um... My question is, what drew you to the character of Lemony Snicket? He's oh. different than like Joe or, you know, uh, Kronk. Yeah, well, that was a fantastic opportunity. Thank thankfully, you know, a, an amazing director and filmmaker like Barry Sonnenfeld and then a writer like Daniel Handler both wanted me to do it. If it was up to, say, like Netflix, you know, I wouldn't have been on their top 200 list because they, they always put you in a box and they're like, oh, you can't do that. But it was Barry and, it was Barry and uh, Daniel who said, no, 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 no. Uh, we need Warburton to do it. So it was just a great opportunity to work with both of them. Um, Daniel had seen a film I did called The Woman Chaser years ago. I didn't realize it, but he was at a QA and a I did with the director of that, and that's kind of what sold him on it. And I'd worked with Barry on a number of projects, The Tick, yeah, yeah. Big Trouble, Men in Black 2, stuff like that. And so um, that's how that came up, yeah. So I got, I never thought I was gonna get a tattoo, and then I got the, the, you know, the tattoo uh, when we were reading s season two, you know, Lemony says, uh, I, at one point in my life, I had uh, a woman that I loved, a home, and a reliable typewriter. I have none of those now. All I have to remind myself of this time in my life is this tattoo. And when I read that, I go, oh, I get that. It's in a discreet area. I'll, I guess I'm getting a tattoo. So I got it. Neil Patrick Harris got the tattoo also. And then he showed up on set and uh, 
Rose, the producer, and Barry Sonnenfeld looked at it, and they go, that's great, we'll have to put makeup over it and do the, do the right one. And he goes, but I got the tattoo. And they go, you got the wrong one. So his tattoo artist took a little, little uh, artistic liberties. I made sure I got mine done. And listen, I never gotten a tattoo, and I knew I was gonna get one tattoo in my life, and this was gonna be it. So I want, when you're gonna get one, you're like, I want Michelangelo to do it, you know? So I <laughs> did a little research, and I got his name's, uh, I believe it's uh, Robert Mahoney. He's uh, considered the godfather of single needle pen and ink, apparently did Tupac's tattoo on his back, and I, I contacted him, and he goes, yeah, I'll do your tattoo. He's like an old uh, Boston, you know, gangster. Uh, it was back in the day, but, uh, you know, real interesting cat. If you look him up on Wikipedia, it says he's more famous than most of the people he, he celebrities he's done tattoos for. And so I was curious, so I was so glad that he was doing my tattoo. I just, I was really cool, and I'm watching him. He's about 70. He's doing my tattoo. He doesn't say anything for a while, and then he goes, uh, I love those national car commercials you do. <laughs> so that's what did it for him, I guess. How did I get in the door? That's awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Hello again. Hi. Uh, hello, Patrick. Um, I'm Jack. Law line in, and uh, I'm glad I got my picture taken with you, and uh, I liked how you did the voice of Kronk from Kronk's New Groove, Emperor's New Groove, Emperor's New School, Buzz Lightyear from Buzz Lightyear of Starkman TV series, and Aliens from TV series and movie, Star Command The Adventure Begins movie. You were also the voice of the talking white dog from DreamWorks' Mr. Peabody and Sherman movie, and space alien police cop from Chicken Little. <laughs> and which one was your favorite? <laughs> which one was your favorite <laughs> character voice role? You know more than I do. Um... <laughs> I still think, you know, Kronk is so close to you know, my favorite, yeah. Um, it was fun, I, yeah, it was the voice of Ag Agamemnon in the Peabody and Sher Sherman movie, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun too. Um, it was fun doing Buzz Lightyear, but it, that was interesting, because I knew I was gonna be the poor man's Buzz, you know? I remember when I was a kid, you know, and then the show would come out, and I'm like, that's not the same guy. <laughs> not sure I like it. And so I, obviously I did it differently too, because if you think about it from an intellectual standpoint, Buzz Lightyear of Star Command is Buzz Lightyear. Tim Allen was just the toy. That's all. <laughs> Why did you? Everybody knows the big Pixar movies are the big deal. Oh. Yeah. But I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna tell Tim that next time. I go. You know, I was Buzz. I was Buzz. You were just the toy. Okay. Why did Why did you do Buzz Lightyear? of Star Command TV series, why did you do him and why didn't Tim Allen do it? Well, because he was a big star. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, they, don't have they don't have time to do a TV show. They're doing their next project. Yeah. That was my, that was my move into the door. They're like, hey, if Tim's not gonna do it, doing I'll do it. And beyond. Perfect. Hello and welcome to Soarin' Over California. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, pal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, Jack. I hope to see you again sometime in California for a tour at Walt Disney. Later, Patrick. I'll be your tour guide, Jack. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's a lot of phones in here. I think I know what's going. I think I know what's going to be trending on uh, Twitter tomorrow. <laughs> One topic: Patrick Warburton, Tim Allen. <laughs> Hello. Hello. My name's Lily. It's nice to meet you. Um, I, I know that you're uh, very well known for your uh, voiceover um, credits, and I wanted to know a little bit more about um, your, like, how you got into voice acting and any tips you have, because I'm an actor myself. Um, and then a bit of a follow-up question, would you like to hear my impression of you? Sure, let's start with that. Okay. <laughs> Right, the poison, the poison for Cusco. Cusco's poison, the poison chosen specifically to kill Cusco. That poison. I love it. Very, very... <laughs> Bravo. You go deep. Thank you, I try. 
<laughs> um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? I wanted to know how you got into voice. Oh yeah, well, I kind of cheated, so, because people ask me, how do you get into voice? Well, I didn't go the normal route because I'd already been just doing live action for about 11 or 12 years when the opportunity for Buzz Lightyear came up. You know, and my wife had talked to me, and she says, why don't you do, you know, cartoons and stuff? And I go, oh, that could be cool. And we lived next door to an agent from a, an agency where they do cartoons, and his partner is, was, an, uh, was a voiceover artist. So I met them, and then I went into the agency, and then that's where I, I just started, you know, right there. Um, some voiceover artists are like chameleons. They do so many different voices. All my characters sort of sound similar. I know, I know, no, it's true. Uh, but um, still, there are different ways to fill. There are different ways you go about, you know, uh, you know, voiceover work like that. But it is about like always creating a character or bringing something in, you know, because they, um, you don't want them to have to like say direct you to sound different or do something different, but you want to be able to take direction. But you always want to like bring something out and like sort of give them show them something or create something so that they're like, oh, okay, the character could sound like that, you know? Um, so yeah, I just think the most important thing to do is just to make a choice and to do something sort of unique if you can, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Unfortunately, that is our time. I know we have uh, a line of people right here. Boo. Uh, <laughs> you're going back to your table after this? Yeah, uh, -huh. uh So if you do have questions, but actually, let's, uh, let's do this. On the count of three, Everybody yell your answer at the same time, or your question at the same time. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three, go. Well. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. Uh, I heard none of that. <laughs> Thank you, please. One Thank more time. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Patrick Warburton.